Welcome to Indie Music Podcast, episode 331, Gain Staging. This morning, Matt and I get together and talk about the process and workflows of gain staging, as well as some sidebars on outboard, input, output, trims, and metering. Enjoy the show. How are you, man? Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Did you recover through the week from your last? Uh, um, yeah, I've pretty much forgotten all about it. <laughs> I had a, I had such a busy project week, all kinds of stuff going on. Just finished a mix. Had a bunch of podcast editing come in. Um, I got a narration to finish and um, talking to some clients about some more mixing projects. Yeah, it's uh, I'm all all recovered from that. Oh, good. <laughs> Asian pause and whatever happened on it. It's just a memory now. <laughs> How are you, man? Oh, oh I'm yeah, doing good. Hair is looking very medieval Renaissance. Um, <laughs> um, it's good. It's good. I like it. I wish my hair could get <laughs> long and and flowy. So what? I need like some kind of like a, a sword, a floppy hat, and uh, oh, a floppy hat ruffles. <laughs> I can't think of the name of the show that I, I used to watch um, last season. And I'm, I'm actually waiting. Oh, Ghost? No. That no. was good. I, I don't think I've seen that. Um, but it's kind of medieval and uh, swords and monsters and mm. uh, 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 a witch hunter, witch. Um, oh, oh, was it based on a video game? It might have been. Or maybe Witcher? the. What? It, Witcher. What? Witcher? Yeah, Witcher. Witcher. I dig that show. I started to watch that. My kids uh, said it was really good. Yeah, I liked it. I just don't have <laughs> I don't have bandwidth for any new series right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I fit in a little bit of time, like uh, 9 p.m. in the yeah. evenings. You know, if I've got some, I don't have anything I'm watching right now. So that's uh, uh, YouTube and, and social for an hour. Yeah, but, I don't have but, any brain power left at that time. So it's a good time to kind of put yeah. a show although i i find that if i if i'm not doing something on the computer at the same time i'm watching a show i kind of like just <laughs> fall right asleep <laughs> so i have to have two parts of my brain working at the time so i'll like do website updates or some other administrative tasks or something yeah uh, while the show's on i don't know it's weird <laughs> so how's your week uh, it was good. I um, uh, still working on wrapping up uh, um, some art revisions on the uh, on the the two CD uh, disc project that I'm um, working on. So that should uh, actually be going to uh, duplication here, um, probably start on Monday. And uh, so excited about that. That puts us uh, within, I don't know, hopefully a couple weeks of production or something like that, and then get the uh, get the order back. And get that over to the client and um oh let's see i got a, a couple singles coming in and then i'm uh working on uh discussions for a uh uh an album it's a i think it's an eight or nine song album cool. and uh yeah yeah and then i've got a couple other things a little bit further out um maybe uh two to three weeks out that uh um i am uh communicating with uh studios on right now so yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. This is the first time that I've heard you mention it. Um, what's your involvement with um, album art? Or is it uh, simply that you're you're waiting on it and helping coordinate all of the timing? Yeah, I coordinate. I work with the graphic artists um, and then uh, between the graphic artists, clients, and, and then uh, uh, managing the proof process and getting uh, approvals. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I take care of, uh, um, once we have approvals, both of the DDP that I create and of the of the art, then uh, I put that package together and and uh, deliver it to the uh, printing uh, duplicator for CDs. Oh, okay. And uh, um, anyway, so I work between uh, the CD company and the clients. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it would it, the only other option would be to actually reproduce CDs myself, and I really don't have no, any no, interest no, no. in that you know so no i just figured that somebody i i just kind of i mean that's like a producer job but i i know we talked about this briefly the other day that um 
most artists are self-producing so yeah they, they no that, that, that's part that. when, for cd orders that's part of what i do so, okay yep and it's it's not as much um uh, producing yeah, i guess you know in a way it is uh but the artist or the 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 graphic artist or the or the music artist or the producer you know mm -hmm. are dealing with with their art concept you know right. and then uh i basically deal with the file management and uh and transfer and oh, okay. uh, and communication that makes um, sense. to uh, uh facilitate getting uh getting the proofs getting approvals and tracking and documenting all that so yeah i meant i didn't mean from a producer producer i meant that in the sense that a producer is often the project manager of the whole project oh uh, well i'm not really a project, a project manager but i'm I, I i am the owner of this part of the project so right um, it's my responsibility to um uh to make sure that we have uh approvals and i just make i get those from everybody that needs to approve things and then once we have an approved package i deliver that package and um and you know and then we'll we'll end up getting proofs back you know from art their art department uh and uh we review those and if the final proofs are approved then um then we give them the okay to go but we're talking about a lot of numbers of uh of production so if you get something wrong in this process it uh it's a real bummer because you end up with however many um uh, uh, sure. you know c cds or or albums in your in your right. order that are printed incorrectly or, with a typo <laughs> yeah exactly so so we go through this it's a necessary uh it's a good thing really and uh, yeah no it's weird though i mean i'm thinking of i have a judas priest cd uh sin after sin and on the cd jacket the cover the um the songs are out of order in one spot you and, know that uh, might have been because the album was in a different order. I bet you. Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, because um, albums they have to have a certain amount of minutes per side, or else it doesn't work out. Yeah, and then they'll they'll do things like uh, rearrange based on dynamic content of the music and put uh, higher dynamic content toward the outside of the of the album and lesser because the uh, the L, the vinyl media. Uh, oh, doesn't sure. reproduce dynamics on the inside as well as it does on the outside. Yeah, it's just yeah. a it's just a physical property of vinyl. Uh, speaking of physical properties of vinyl, I heard that there's um I just heard from a friend who's getting vinyl reproduced uh, through Third Man Records um incidentally, and um he was saying that he found out something uh, what's it called pre echo. There's this thing where if your music's to a, a certain um level the grooves sometimes are cut too wide and um, they're close enough together that one groove will pick up sound vibrations for the other groove and you'll hear what's called pre-echo um, between songs. You'll hear like a faint echo of the song that's about to play. Um, because you, you, you know what that is? It, it's, it's actually from the magnetic tape used in you know masters to produce the lacquer of the vinyl okay so and uh, one of the reasons that um um we do tail outs on our uh, winding so when, when when you um finish uh recording on, on a reel mm -hmm. you leave it with the tail out um and that's because if there's any um pre-echo it actually mm -hmm. becomes post echo, and so uh -oh. the, and so you don't hear that like you do pre echo. And if you leave your your uh, the head in, you know, or head out, then you'll get pre echo. And what that is is magnetic transference from one layer wrapped around the reel to the next. Uh, interesting. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> pardon me, and that creates the pre echo. And uh, so that's over time. So if a tape's wound up for a while the 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 magnetic particles from one layer of tape transfer to the next layer of tape and you get that that pre-echo and then that'll transfer into the vinyl Interesting. Um, i've never yeah. heard that before yeah that's a that's a magnetic tape thing though i see it's all fascinating all this stuff yeah yeah <laughs> but but if you ever wondered why people leave their reels tape out uh, I don't know if you've ever wondered that or not. I've never wondered that. <laughs> yeah, but that that's why, you know, most people go, damn, the guy didn't rewind that for me. Well, there's a reason. So, uh, I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've seen that on film, but um, yeah, I feel, I deal 
almost exclusively or all, yeah i deal pretty much exclusively with digital yeah digital yeah. media digital transfer digital everything so <laughs> i don't have any rewinding tapes or yeah you know all these all these or... mediums have uh have their own uh characteristics and idiosyncrasies yeah. you know so yeah I'm most it's impressed funny. like over time though with vinyl. Um just the longevity of vinyl. Um yeah, yeah, if you, it's one of the most you know, if you take care of it. Plastic. Yeah, you could take you could give equal care to your uh uh your tapes and cassettes or reels and uh that you do to your vinyl, but I still think vinyl will outlast um uh, the magnetic media. Um and you know, and you know, I I go and frequently um buy old vinyl mm -hmm. and uh, it just always amazes me how good of shape the uh um you know the media is after you know 30 years or whatever oh and... yeah i was at goodwill yesterday and i saw this guy has parked himself on the floor and was just going through the entire they have a pretty good selection of vinyl at uh at my local goodwill store and uh he had he just planted himself there on the floor as the older guy and was just going through record by record <laughs> looking for gold in there or something i don't know what he was looking for i was looking for <laughs> so, so anyway that's all fascinating stuff <coughs> excuse me you have inhaled <laughs> right some there. coffee yeah oh yeah coffee goes to the stomach air goes to the lungs yeah <clears throat> i have to remind myself sometimes too it's fun <laughs> after all these years still get it wrong sometimes yeah now i'm gonna create more edits <coughs> Oh, sorry. And for those sorry. that are watching the video, um, that won't be edited out. So <laughs> right. <laughs> you get to watch me and listen to me cough. So well, speaking of edits, I think we were going to talk a little bit about gain staging today. Yeah, I was interested. Um I, I it was actually from a either a conversation or um or a podcast or or both um a while back. And uh you had kind of alluded that you have um, kind of a process or workflow for gain staging that you go through. And, yeah. you know, and I was kind of curious, uh, I thought that'd be good to maybe share as an example of, of one way um, to set up gain staging, you know, and, and what kind of things you're thinking of, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of this gain staging is in, in setup. And right. then, uh, but then as you're moving through your mix, you know, I know that it's always a, a continual process of, of gain staging right. for what you're working on. But uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, I, I kind of wanted to get an idea of what you're looking at. And I might have something to add, um, yeah, you know, with regards to when you introduce uh, a, a analog outboard into that. So. Right, which I don't have. But um, yeah, so gain staging is the, essentially to define it as the process of, of um, making is, is making sure that the level of your signal is is uh correct for your project uh, gain being input level as opposed to volume which is output level right so you need to manage that from basically from the time you start recording uh and uh i don't know i'm looking at my my uh my interface here has you know um, a meter of every time somebody says something my meter jumping up and down and if you're in the red usually there's a clipping uh light or or something that comes on even at the recording stage. And if you're clipping, then you're either your gain is too high or your signal's too hot and you need to make an adjustment because if you don't have a good clean signal at the at the recording level, then that's gonna there's no fixing that later, right? So you want a good hot signal coming in. Um it needs to be above what's called the noise floor, which uh speaking of mediums, um is not as much a concern in the digital realm for the most part, because Digital is so clean, almost too clean. You want to add dirt to it later, but um, it used to be more of a concern with tape because you have to be your signal should be high enough above what's called the noise floor, which is like the tape hiss or the ambient room noise or whatever, so that you can uh, either it, it either overpowers it to the point where you can't hear it or you can gate it out later. Um, so you start there, but once you have all of your good your tracks recorded, and I I'm still shooting for kind of the same level recording as mixing, which is um, in the neighborhood of minus 18 dBFS, um, dB full scale, um, which uh, which is kind of like just it's kind of a standard 
um, traditionally. And uh, what I do when I get tracks in, so here's my gain staging process. I get all my tracks in and I put them into my template and I have the first, the first plugin as an insert on all of my tracks um, is a is a channel stripped plugin with a VU meter, right? And I use it as a trim plugin. And what I do is I I just kind of put the song on a loop where all of the things are playing, and I just go through. I don't even have to listen to it. I can just watch the meter, and just I go through and make sure that that the meter is between the threes, as they used to say. So it's basically it's kissing the zero, which the zero is usually set to 18 minus 18 dBFS on a VU meter is the zero. So I just before I even touch any faders, I leave all the faders at unity gain, which is zero. And I go through and make sure that every song, I mean, every track in the song is basically at a good level before I even touch any faders. So the quiet ones come up. The hot ones go down. The hot ones are almost always guitars for some reason, and the kick and the the snare. Um, so that before I even touch any faders, everything is basically level matched. And then comes the mixing process. So that's a way that I make sure it, it serves two purposes. One, it level matches everything. And two, it it kind of forces me to go through and check what each what each track is because sometimes they're not labeled in a way that I know what it is. So I'm kind of forced to listen to it and put it in its proper place. But that's where I start with gain staging. There's another way to do it, but um, did you have any questions about that or, or comments about that? Um, no, I, not really. The, um, do you have the, the concept, you know, like in the mix of like uh, IO trims, um, you know, uh, where you, because minus 18 is really low. It is low. Um, and uh, so like if I had uh, minus 18, well, I guess, for example, my, I have uh, IO trims in my, um, uh, in my Lynx Hilo and mm -hmm. which does my, uh, my conversion for me and has my analog outputs. And I think, um, I'm either running at plus 20 DB or plus 24 DB. And really that, that number is kind of determined by what the, uh, maximum headroom of, uh, of your, uh, outboard gear is. So if you have, uh, one piece of outboard gear that might be plus 20, and others are are higher than that. Then, yeah, you, like you would set your IO trims to plus twenty because you wouldn't want to uh, uh, go over the rating for that that one piece of gear that's in the chain. If you're using it, if you're not using it, you could certainly adjust that to uh, to higher if you wanted. And what that gives you is um, is a lot of headroom for hmm. uh, uh, for your levels. Yeah, and um, and it, but I don't know that I've ever when I was mixing, I had that kind of concept in digital. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure if these it plugins... No, that's not something that I look at, really. Um, but I am looking at peaks, too. I'm looking at still peaks no more than, you know, minus six to minus three. Um, I don't want it anywhere near uh, clipping. So that minus 18 is really RMS, you know, the average signal. Yeah. Um, although I'm you know, I'm I'm on, on the view meter. I'm just I'm just trying to get them all to basically the same general level. There's another way to do it that I've tried before, and it to me it's a little more tedious because you know putting a song on a loop and then just going click you know flipping from track to track and adjusting the the trim so that the view meter hits a certain level. There's another way to do it where you reference everything against pink noise, so you can put pink noise on a loop on another track, set that to your desired level like minus six dbfs and then go through and adjust the volume of each track until you can just hear it over the pink noise mm -hmm. um it's a very it's a different way to achieve basically the same result and when you mute the pink noise and play it back you'll you'll find that you have a surprisingly balanced mix without touching any faders when you do it that way like my my vu meter i don't use pink but i use uh, a sine one uh a sine wave uh um, right i'm trying to remember like 400 um yeah. i know and and a thousand i think or or maybe it's ten thousand um but uh and then uh calibrate that vu meter 
uh, which I believe is uh, calibrated at uh, at plus four. Uh, right. So this is zero. Or no, is it eighteen? Mm -hmm. Now I can't. Now I don't remember. Anyway, um, I'd have to go check my notes. But uh, there's a there's a set level that I set the sine wave at for output, and then I zero that uh, I zero both the meters on that on that sine wave output. Uh, yeah, so it's basically the same way of achieving yeah. the same thing. It can be it can be whatever you want. It's kind of arbitrary. There's no like set standard for that. It's it's what uh, uh, you want to calibrate it to for right. for your studio for your gear. But uh, yeah, I never quite understood the whole plus four plus ten or whatever that was. It's well, that's, like that's the difference between line and yeah, uh, 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 line and line levels and uh, yeah, pro gear and consumer gear, um, mm -hmm. which might be uh, that might be balanced versus. Uh, um uh you know unbalanced or or you know like yeah. rca and things like that um yeah. but yeah so there's so yeah so there's a couple other considerations one is that um so what i do is i take my tracks and then i bust them all you know all my drums go to a bus all my and then i kind of balance the buses against each other and that's just part of the mixing process but something else and sometimes what happens is when all of those sum together when they come to the bus then they can be then the bus can be too hot and I have to either make adjustments um, at the bus or, you know, at the individual track level. So that's like a second phase of gain staging. Yeah. I feel like the one that gets missed a lot is, um, especially with these analog plugins and especially with channel strips that have an input output, there's gain staging sometimes within the plugin itself. And maybe you can consider um, compressors where they have a, you know, it compresses, but then there's also a, a makeup gain. So that's kind of gain staging as well, too. You have to watch clipping within um, some plugins, like, yeah, compressors, um, channel strips, some of those plugins. And and, conf uh, and even a little bit more confusing is sometimes those plugins, like I'm thinking specifically of, uh, there's a, a Kramer HLS, which is a Helios console plugin, has an input output. Some of these analog modeling plugins like to be pushed into the red within the plugin. They have, uh, you know, 32-bit float, so they're not actually clipping, even though like the clipping light comes on. And what that's kind of indicating is that you're you're getting more, you know, transformer-style saturation within the plugin, and then you can adjust the output level so that you get the saturation, but you're not overloading the the actual track. What does that do for you is with regards to like inter sample clipping, um, you know, with a plugin like that? Are you actually getting uh, on sample clipping on those, which, you know, obviously it sounded like you're dealing with, but what about uh, in between samples? I don't think so. I, I rarely actually push those plugins to do that. Um, I don't like to, I don't like to see clipping or red no matter where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to. It's supposed to handle it uh, if they're well written, which most of the big companies are. There's. It's supposed to handle all of that internally and not actually clip, and not actually reach the the limit because it's doing. You know, like I said, thirty two bit float or something internally that keeps it from actually hitting that digital limit, um, while still adding more saturation yeah. within the itself. You know what's really important with this is uh, is when you're dealing with clipping is uh like for us we can we can replay this stuff and, and our converters are are good um and they're good enough to where um they'll reproduce uh um stuff that has clipping in it without actually clipping it um so oh, it's a, so you need to have like a really crappy DAC you know <laughs> which which your computer is an example of having yeah. a really oh, most yeah. computers have really crappy DACs in them is to not play these back through your interface, but to use your your computer audio, or right. or to uh, uh, you know some other old device that you've got that uh, you know that's just a um, low you know cheap um, uh, digital analog converter. And by digital analog, that's it's taking uh, your digital signal to an MP3 or whatever, and mm -hmm. it's playing it out your speakers. Okay, that's that's a, a speakers are analog, and you know, and so. There's a conversion that happens there where it actually converts the digital audio into an analog signal. Okay, and so that that's what we're talking about. And when that conversion happens, especially on lower quality um, DACs, the uh, 
um, the clipping can then become really apparent. So yeah. it's an it's a good way to, if you're not sure, is you know probably just play it through your laptop or something like that. Yeah. Well, and um, so I have the Apple tool that'll find inner sample clipping. Okay. You run MP3s or waves. Yeah. Through the droplet or the round trip. The droplet. Yeah. 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 Um, round trip. Right. And um, also some plugins will tell you, like um, Ozone, for instance, if you put Ozone on your bus, you can click, you can tell it to monitor for intersample clipping and it will find them and it will yeah. remove them. Well, it, it, you know, you've got your your RMS, which will indicate to you your on-sample clipping and then uh, your peak meters. Uh, uh, so like the momentary and peak. Um, you know, if those are in the red, then th that indicates that you're going to have intersample clipping, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so you need to look at both, uh, both RMS and peak and, uh, you know, to be assured that that you're not getting into a clipping situation. And it's not that it's not that clipping is, is a bad thing. And you can certainly have some momentary clipping throughout mm -hmm. your track and not have that be a problem. Um, it is a problem if you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, submit to specification. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but if if if, it, if that's not a concern, um, uh, you just want to make sure you don't have any uh, uh, longer <laughs> periods of of clipping. You know, where they're really audible because it's it's um, uh, not a, not really a desirable sound, in my opinion. Right. I'm certainly I I. I I would assume that people are using that artistically if they'd like to, you know, but I don't think that that is, um, uh, what would I say? Uh, like, um, reproducible in the same way across all systems, it's going to sound different depending on the, uh, the quality of your, uh, uh, of your system and its ability to, um, it's resol it's resolution, you know, so higher resolving DACs may not clip at all. Um, so you may not get that effect uh, um, the same on every device that you listen to. So I have a quick question about that. Uh, some, uh, some, I want to say better plugins will uh, do over, will allow you to do oversampling. And that's where it kind of resamples everything and make. And I think that that helps guard against uh, intersample clipping. Um, yeah, but I don't know that it prevents it entirely, but. I think there's some uh, with oversampling. There's considerations with uh, producing uh, additional um, harmonics mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and actually changing the tonal characteristics of the of the signal with oversampling. Uh, there's some good videos on this. Um, and it's not something that I actually run into or 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 do much with at all. Uh, so I probably shouldn't try to describe it, but um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, with oversampling, you know, and, and it, I'm more concerned with downsampling and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and how, and, and dithering and things like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the oversampling I think can, uh, uh, can be, can be a good thing. Uh, you just want to be careful of the harmonics that are getting created in the oversampling. Yeah. I, I, I think that usually you get higher quality and whatever it is you are oversampling, but it also, um, is harder on your CPU, so you yeah. may have, you may not be able to do it depending on what else you have going on in your in your project. Yeah, like with regards to um, oversampling and um, and like Apple Music, they recommend not doing it. Mm. Uh, uh, they it it provides no uh, audible uh, benefit to the to the music, you know, and um, you know, uh, you're filling if you're when you're oversampling, you're you're filling in um, um, data that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. You know, and so how it does that, I'm not exactly sure. But like dithering, when you're downsampling, um, you're 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 losing data, and right. so it, it's filling it in with noise, basically. Right. You know, and uh, uh, so that it's not. Um, empty, you know, or null data. Yeah. Um, and then the converse is true with uh, um, uh, with oversampling because the data didn't exist. So you've got to add something in there. Um, it, I think for me, and, and it's part of, you know, I, I've got this written into my uh, um, 
uh, what do you, you know, my information sheet for, for new clients is that uh, uh, record at the uh, resolution that you intend to distribute at, you know, so it should start, you know, if you want to do, um, you know, 48 uh, K then record at 48 K, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, yeah. or, or if you want to do 96, then give up half your channels and record at 96, <laughs> you know? Um, well, that's a tough one because I'm, I'm starting to see people record at 96, but if they want to see D then they have to go down to 44 one. Yeah. And that's okay, you know, for CD. Um, and that it, that's there's no way around that. That's that's the um, you know it's 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 forty four sixteen bit. You know, so that's what it is. Um, but I'd much rather uh, I'd I'd much rather go down and uh, and dither than oversample and go up. Uh, oh, that's interesting to know. I mean, I always oversample as I mean, I'm sorry. I always dither as a rule when I'm down sampling. Yeah. Um, and I think you should, because that can um, uh, really degrade your audio um, if you don't dither. Right, right. Do you, I've, I've seen a couple of videos on this, and uh, I don't know if this is true or not. Do you think that I saw a video of a very well-known producer who claims that he can hear the difference between 48k and 41k and says that he likes the sound of 41k better <laughs> i feel like i know you're laughing i feel like that's to me that sounds like when you're when you're spending 10 minutes tweaking a plug-in and you can hear the difference and then you realize that it's in bypass <laughs> it was <all> your <laughs> but i just want to think you know can you hear the difference I mean, CDs still Me? sound great. Yeah, I just... no, not really. I I mean, uh, you've used the round trip plugin before, right? So yeah. have you have you done the auditioning, the AB auditioning in the plugin? No, because you're you're going from uh, um, lossless wave AB with a compressed AAC format there. So um, I I fail that all the time. I go through and. And, uh, you know, I might guess, you know, two out of 10 times, which one is which. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. Use the plugin and and do that because that's kind of a, a valid test for, um, you know, what you just posed there. No, I, I don't think I can <laughs> accurately hear the difference between, uh, you know, those two resolutions. Me either. <laughs> I just wanted to know if you thought there was any credence to that. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a silly thing to argue about. I've seen um, some uh, videos uh, that are studies at colleges on this, and they've got like a, a, a large sample of people who are coming up and then going through the round trip. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of people that, that guess incorrectly um, is is greater than uh, than those that actually um, uh, get it right, you know. So yeah. I, I I don't think there's a um, I don't think there's any scientific uh, support for being able to the human ear being able to tell the difference. Yeah, yeah. I, I I'm gonna agree with that. I certainly agree that you can hear the difference between an MP3 and a wave, but not 41k and 44k. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean the, uh, yeah, well, yeah. When you're talking about lossless versus, um, compressed, mm -hmm. I, I, there's a difference there. Lossy sure. compressed. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And so even with that between, uh, and to, um, you know, to Apple on this nice job because the, the, the AAC, um, conversion, is is really good. I'm actually I use it for my samples on my website. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I like it so much just because I was convinced after doing all the ABs between waves, and not being able to discern a difference. Um, uh, it's a nice file size, and so I just started using those on my websites so instead of MP3s because I think they sound better than MP3. Cool. I will have to give that a listen. 
Um, I think that one of the things that's important in all of this with gain staging and inner sample clipping is to make sure you have a, um, a decent meter at the end of your chain that can detect all of that stuff and that you monitor closely. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's critical. Um, I use Insight too. What what do right. you like to use? Um, I'm still using uh, the Ulean loudness meter. Oh yeah, yeah. I got the full version, and so I have that set to AES all the time. Yeah, I always like that one. I would yeah, recommend that one too. Yeah, I mean, even the free version uh, is is well worth it. Yeah, Insight's not free, but it's it's really it's been really great. So I. Uh... I like it. The other one that's good is the Waves WLM. Yeah. That's a great meter. I the, um, that. Uh, what is it? I have, I still have a free version of it. Do I? Yeah, it's the Studio Session Analyzer, which is, um, it didn't give me the name of the software there. Uh, who makes that? It's, it's beautiful. It's probably the most beautiful plugin. I do not know. Okay, I'm opening it. Let's see if this kills uh studio session analyzer. Come on, tell me who the oh flux. <laughs> Thank you. Flux. Oh flux. Yeah. Uh oh. love flux. It's it's kind of spindy. Um, but it's absolutely gorgeous. So for one, if you it, the the whole visual aspect of looking at flux is enjoyable, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, That's and I, important. That's it is, important. and, and well, that, that means that the metering, um, is, uh, is laid out well, it's easily understandable and it's, and it's, and it's very pretty, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the colors and the graphs and things like that. Uh, I do like it a lot. I didn't buy into flux because I decided to go with insight because mm -hmm. I think that might've been a cost decision. Um, <laughs> and, and insight wasn't uh, necessarily cheap. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, I think if you're going to go, f go like free or, or, uh, um, uh, donation, uh, supported something like, uh, Yulian or Yulene, if you're from the Midwest, um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and if you want to go paid, then I, I certainly would recommend, uh, Insider Flux. Yeah. Or Double. Now the flux that I have is actually one that I uh, back when I had my focus right, it was uh, uh, provided as one of the uh, oh. pl plugins in the collective. You know, so that was like a, a, a kind of a, a sweet bonus. Is probably one of my favorite. Uh, uh, well, that's a, ones that's I a received. Good point. Yeah, you should check and see what meters they already have. They may already have something they didn't even realize it, like right. Doro or or something built in like i know there's a lot of great meters already built into logic and i'm sure other DAWs also have good metering oh of course that um, you may just not even know that you have a really good you know loudness meter intersample peak meter et cetera, et cetera. yeah yeah use what at your disposal i've got i don't have my ipad here now but uh my app my ipad works with my um with my uh converter and so i have meters on my ipad for my converter that i can look at and, you know, so that's built into the hardware that I have. So you might have something in your DAW. I don't know if Logic integrates with, I think it would, uh, with iPad. Uh, yeah. Where you, yeah, yeah, because you, you can sidecar. And well, then... Well, there's an app you can get called Logic Remote, and you can do you can use your iPad or as a as yeah. a um, surface, as a control surface. Oh, nice. Well, there's also sidecar with your iPad that would, uh, um, and then you can send your, vi your, um, your metering to your iPad for visualization oh, and have yeah. that on it, which is really cool. And, uh, Start um, that. yeah, check that out. <laughs> it, so yeah, then that'll use the meter. And since you're on logic, that's all native. Um, it'll, it should all work. Um, yeah, cool. Hey, I think we're about out of time. <laughs> yeah, we are about out of time. Um, uh, thanks everybody for sticking with us for listening and, uh, yeah. Thanks, Matt. Enjoyed the conversation this morning. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. Have a good rest of your day. And uh, thanks, everybody. Take care. Yeah. Have a great have a week. week. Peace.